you stand across the house and join me in prayer as we open up our service tonight? Ask God to have his way. I also want to ask you to remember uh, some of the folks that are not able to be with us tonight. we got some that are taking care of some family things that they got going on. But we also got a lot of folks that are battling sickness. And we've, we've uh, listed these every night. But God knows their need. God knows what they're dealing with. we got a, quite a few folks that are, are sick that have been battling this sickness. It's going around. It's hit my house. My youngest one, Christian, she is uh, at home now with a little over 103 fever. Uh, so remember her and uh, uh, all these others that are battling some sickness. Sheila Just is real sick. And um, uh, quite a few left that party, that little get-together last night sick. I told them that must have been some party they had last night. A little get-together they had at the church last night for one of our ladies for her birthday. That must have been a rough one. I wasn't here for that one. If the way everybody got sick, I'm glad I didn't. <laughs> Glory to God. But uh, it is good to be in the Lord's house. Amen. Well, that was weak. You are a dead bunch right there. I'm picking up, Brother Jimmy. <laughs> dead bunch right there. But let's ask the Lord to have his way in our service. We're so thankful. Listen, do you want the, the eyes of your heart open tonight? Would you like God to just to speak to you and minister to you and, and touch you? Or did you just come out to watch a show and say you came to church and going back to the house? Listen, I come to have an encounter with Jesus. I want to see the master show up in this place tonight and touch people's lives and hearts. Listen, in the Bible said we're two or three of God in his name. He's in the midst, so the Lord's here. Amen. Brother Mike, did you come in the name of the Lord? I came in the name of the Lord. So the Lord's right here in the midst of us somewhere. I believe that. I believe that's what the Word says, and I stand on the Word of God. So let's pray tonight. Ask God to have His way in these needs and our service, uh, that God would just move and minister and touch hearts and lives. Father, we love you so much. Thank you for the opportunity that you've given us, God, to come in your house tonight. I pray, God, that you would touch our musicians, our singers, our worship leaders. God, I pray that you touch Kelsey today, God, as she leads us in this time of worship. I pray, God, that your will be done. Father, we give you the praise, the glory, and the honor for what's done and what will be done. I lift up these needs to you tonight, God. I pray for Christian. God, that you will minister her. Let her feel your touch, your strength. Even now, God, break this fever in her body. God, I pray for these others that are battling sickness, God, that you will move in them and minister them. Lord, I, I don't know what this bug is going around. I'm not real sure what's going on, but it's touched not just my immediate family, but my, 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 uh, my wife's family, God, and their whole family is battling this sickness. I pray for Paula and and Caleb and Rachel and Abby and the family, God, that you will move in them and minister them and touch them by your mighty power, God. Touch Sister Janet, Lord, and Susan tonight, God, as they've been battling sickness, God. I pray that you administer them in the name of Jesus. Father, we just lift up these that are battling cancer on our list. God, these that are battling kidney issues and, and lung issues and all the things that are going on, God. We know that we are calling on the name of the Lord who is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, God. And I thank you for that tonight. I pray that you would be with those that are having to deal with some family issues tonight, God. Those that are, are having to be at other places, God, for prior engagements, Lord. I pray that you would move and minister to our, our folks, God, that you would let your will be accomplished in their life. Father, we just surrender this time to you tonight. And I pray, God, that your divine will will be accomplished and that your name will be lifted up on high. And, Father, we'll give you the praise. We'll give you the glory. We'll give you the honor for it all. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name. And everybody saying, amen. Would you worship with Kelsey and as they sing it this time? Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you.
To get ready to do this next song, you could be seated for just a moment. For us as we come, we're going to receive our offering tonight. 
Brother Jimmy has blessed us this week with the Word of God. And uh, we want to bless this man of God. God would just have his way and his needs. And our crowds have been off this week because of sickness and a little bit of everything going on. It's been kind of crazy this week. But uh, I know the ones that have been here have been blessed. And uh, just thank God for that. But give us unto the Lord. And uh, I said this the other night. I said, all, all y'all got to make up for those that aren't here. <laughs> so we appreciate it. It's good to have Pastor David Price with us from Maiden Church. He's going to put a couple hundred in tonight. We appreciate that. And uh, uh, <laughs> uh, I'm just teasing. But it's good to have you all with us. Thank you so much for coming out and worshiping with us tonight. And it's good to have Brother Sister Ivy with us again. We just thank God for people who come out to worship with us. And uh, we look forward to what the Lord has. So let's uh, pray over our offering. Ask God to have his way. Father, we love you so much. Thank you for the opportunity that you give us to come into your house. Father, the chance to be able to, to bless your kingdom work. I just pray today, God, that your will be done, that you would speak it to the hearts of each and every giver tonight. God, allow them and, and bless them in, in, in a way, God, that they will be able to give according to your divine will and your purpose. I pray, God, that you would do use each and every gift for the upbuilding of your kingdom. Bless the gift and the giver. and Let your will be done today. I will give you the praise, the glory, and the honor for all that's done and all that will be done. We magnify your holy name. We ask these things in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Come on, worship and give. worship me. Just give yourself to me completely. I have all of this in control. It is all about me. It's not about you. So um, this song is what came to my mind. And um, we're going to do this tonight.
of Solomon it's a story of a pursuit it's a pursuit of a, of a bride after a bridegroom and a bridegroom after a bride it's a pursuit in Song of Solomon chapter 8 verse 6 and 7 the Bible says set me as a seal upon thine heart as a seal upon thine arm for love is strong as death jealousy is cruel as the grave the coals thereof are fire, coals of fire which hath the most vehement flame many waters cannot quench love neither can the floods drown it. If a man would give all the substance of his house for love, it would utterly be condemned. And what this scripture is saying is, is that God will not give up coming after you. Amen. The the bride is saying, listen, I want you to write it upon my heart. I want you to write it as a seal on my arm. And I am coming after you, oh God. And God has said, I'm coming after you too. Aren't you thankful that God came to where you were? Aren't you thankful that God sought you out and looked where you were and didn't give up on you? I'm thankful that God didn't give up on me. I'm thankful that the Lord sought me out where I was. Listen, I was in some places that God should have never went, but He came to those places. I was in some places hanging out doing stuff I should have never done, but God said, I'm going in there after you, son. Aren't you thankful that He doesn't relent, that He doesn't give up, that He doesn't back down from a challenge, that God just keeps on coming? Amen? Amen. Let's worship together. You won't relent until you have it all. My heart is yours. Come on, make that a prayer. You won't relent until you have it all. My heart is yours. Come on, let's do that one more time. You won't relent until you have it all my heart is yours you won't relent until you have it all my heart is yours so I said you as a sea seal upon my arm for there is love that is as strong as death jealousy demanding as a grave and many waters cannot quench this love
Come be the flame upon my heart. Come be the fire inside of me until you and I are one. Come be the fire inside of me. Come be the flame upon my heart. Come be the fire inside of me until Brother Jimmy's coming. I just want to say thanks to Jake and dear. I think I said that right. Dear, dear, appreciate them coming to help us tonight. Did my baby do pretty good tonight for her first time? That was pretty good, huh? Amen. Now, would you let Brother Jones know we appreciate him tonight? I tell you right now, I did not covet being in her position. She did a wonderful job. Just put your hands together and bless her one more time. Bless the Lord. Hallelujah. I was just thinking about the power of the Word of God and uh, heard this story. It's been some years ago that I heard it, but in, in the country of South America, I believe it was, a preacher walking along this jungle road. A young man came along and held him up, wanted money from the preacher, and the preacher said, I ain't got no money. And so he saw that the preacher had his Bible. He said, well, give me that Bible. Took that Bible and left. Some years went by, and uh, this pastor, this preacher, was in, in a, a convention, a meeting somewhere, and a young man came up to me, to him and said, do you, do you remember me? And uh, the preacher said, no, I've never seen you before in my life. And the young man said, oh, yes, you have. He said, do you remember that day you were walking through the jungle and somebody uh, robbed you, took your Bible? Preacher said, yeah. Young man said, that was me. Preacher said, what did you do with my Bible? Young man said, well, preacher, be honest with you, I smoked it. He said, I ripped the pages out and I, I smoked marijuana in it. He said, I smoked Matthew and I smoked Mark and I smoked Luke. He said, but preacher, when I got to John, he said, John smoked me. The power of the Word of God. Uh, he probably did something besides smoke it. He probably read a leaf or two. God, that's the last thing in the world you ought to do if you want to stay away from God. Don't crack the door at all. He won't relent until he has it all. Well, you just missed a good place to shout. The book of Ruth, chapter 4. Turn there with me while you're doing that. So good to have Brother and Sister Ivy with us tonight, Brother and Sister Price, their children, and uh, all of you that are in the house of the Lord. I appreciate your being here. If you help me for the next little while, something I want to share with you, God being my helper. The book of Ruth, chapter 4. A friend of mine told me some years ago, he said, I always look for something in that service before I ever get to the pulpit to uh, confirm the direction I have for the service. 
And uh, uh, whenever that the pastor said a little bit ago about a, a, a groom pursuing a bride, uh, that was the confirmation I, I was looking for tonight. I appreciate the goodness of the Lord. Good to have Brother and Sister Gibson tonight. Uh, precious folks, appreciate them. Uh, the book of Ruth, chapter 4, going to begin reading with verse 7. If you're there, say amen. Now this was the manner in the in former time in Israel concerning redeeming and concerning changing. For to confirm all things, a man plucked off his shoe and gave it to his neighbor. And this was a testimony in Israel. Therefore the kinsman said unto Boaz, Buy it for thee, so he drew off his shoe. And Boaz said unto the elders and unto all the people, Your witnesses this day that I have bought all that was Elimelech's and all that was Chilion's and Malon's of the hand of Naomi. Verse 10, Moreover Ruth, the Moabitess, the wife of Malon, have I purchased to be my wife. If you will notice, verse 7, the Bible said that man plucked off his shoe or said that he would, and then in verse 8 said he did draw off his shoe, and he gave that shoe to Boaz. You ever wondered? Have you ever wondered what happened to that shoe? I, yeah, it ain't a heaven or hell issue, but have you ever been curious enough that you just wondered? Right, what ever happened to that shoe? Uh, I got an idea what, about what may have happened to it tonight. I'm going to share that with you. I'm going to preach for just a little while on this thought simply. What you going to do with that old shoe? May please don't mind it. Help us preach. You may be seated. Sit down, but don't sit down on me. Now, I can look at you and tell what I just said don't mean nothing. So you hang on with me for the next little while, if you will. The title of my message is simply what you're going to do with that old shoe. Now, the customs of Israel are uh, among the oldest that are around, and, and they're among the most beautiful of any culture in all the world. They are as strange uh, as they are unique. In many cultures, it is easy to defend or to offend uh, that host culture with something as simple as a shoe. Wouldn't think that, but it is a fact. Uh, you know, they most cultures don't make of shoes what we do uh, in, in uh, the Western world in America. Uh, you know, there are a lot of folks don't know what a shoe is. They just go barefooted all of their lives. Uh, somebody said, uh, you know, that 90% that of that rapture, uh, those folks going to get to heaven and, and never had running water and never had a wooden floor. Just had a dirt floor. All uh, They're going to get in that rapture. Uh, you know, probably 90% got not going to know whether a Mercedes is a car or a cow. Uh, you know, they just don't, uh, other cultures just don't make all of the fuss over shoes that we, we do uh, in the Western world. Mr. Obama, not long after he'd become president, in, offended the entire nation of Israel uh, when he did a video. Uh, and, and when all of the world saw it, his foot's up on a desk and you can see the bottom of his shoe. That was an insult to the whole of the nation of Israel. To this day, I doubt that Mr. George W. Bush uh, understands the contempt uh, that that man, that reporter had when he threw his shoe at him and Mr. Mr. Bush had to duck. I don't know that he really understands or comprehends to this day, uh, you know, the contempt uh, contained in that expression. The story before us tonight, and I only lifted a portion of it, as you already know, the story centers around a single shoe, but it does not begin with a single shoe. It begins with the family, the family of Elimelech, who moved temporarily away from Bethlehem, Judah, uh, and they went into the land of Moab. They only intended to stay for a short while. They were going to be sojourners. They weren't going to be there long, and then they were going to go home. They wound up spending at least a decade in the land of Moab. They stayed there long enough until them boys fell in love. Now, Elimelech might leave uh, after them boys fell in love and, and after they got married, but he's going to have a tough time getting Naomi out of Moab. Most mamas are that way. You don't have to shout there, I'm married to a mama. Uh, the, the, point, the, the point is, uh, you know, they, they hadn't intended to stay long. They did. Those boys found wives among those Moabites, and they married. In time, though, all three husbands would die. Elimelech and his two sons. So we're left with what one Baptist preacher called uh, three widows in a wash pot. 
uh, of, of Moab, the Bible said, over uh, Edom will I cast my shoe, and Moab is my wash pot. Uh, so we have three widows uh, in a wash pot. Uh, and the story here has to do, what I'm going to deal with tonight, has to do more with Ruth, uh, you know, Naomi's da daughter-in-law, and a shoe than it does anybody else. Uh, Ruth, the, to begin what I'm going to deal with for a little while, Ruth had an identity crisis once she got to Bethlehem, Judah. Uh, Naomi would be defined by a decade. But when she got home, everybody knew her. They just didn't know the girl that she brought with her. Ruth uh, got to Bethlehem, Judah, and discovered that she had an identity crisis. Uh, when you read the Word of God, she is referred to as a damsel. You'd think at some point, uh, you know, not long after arriving, uh, they'd use some word besides a damsel. She was a damsel, which simply meant she was just a girl. She was further labored, labeled rather as the Moabitish damsel. Uh, you know, the damsel from a, a cursed nation. Uh, she was further referred to uh, by Naomi, and then later on, I, I think Boaz would refer to her this way. She was referred to as my daughter. Not a proper name, you know, just some abstract identity. She became known as a gleaner. Everybody in that culture knew that if you went in the fields after the reapers, then you were the gleaner. And if you were a gleaner, they knew that you were poor. They knew that you were either an orphan or that you were a widow. But if you went into that field as a gleaner, you were a marked person. Everybody knew that you were at the bottom of the totem pole, the bottom of the economic ladder. Uh, you know, these reapers would go in ahead of the gleaners, and the gleaners would gather what's left over, what's been trampled underfoot. She was also referred to as Ruth the Moabitess. I don't know why the folks couldn't just call her Ruth. It's always Ruth plus something. Ruth, the Moabitess. She was the wife of Malon. Now, Malon is a dead man, uh, but she is known technically as the wife of the dead. Have you ever in your experience felt like in your walk with God that things were going so bad until you felt like the wife or the husband of the dead? Nothing goes right. Everything's absolutely wrong. Everything is against you. Well, she came into Bethlehem, Judah, the place where God had visited them and had given them bread, and she could not find an identity. Back home, everybody knew her as Ruth, but here they know her by everything but Ruth. Well, after some time in that country, uh, Naomi decides, I'm going to help her get established. I'm going to help her find an identity. She came in from work one day, and Naomi said to Ruth, she said to her, she said, I want you to, uh, to, 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 to take a bath. I, I can almost hear Ruth say, well, uh, that's, that's kind of the idea. Been in that field all day. I kind of had an idea taking a bath. She said, after you take a bath, I want you to put on uh, different clothes. You're going back out. Well, uh, she washed and she changed her clothes. And Naomi said to her, I want you to anoint yourself. Uh, she was just saying to her, to her, I want you to perfume yourself. She said, the reason I want you to do this is Boaz is going to be down at the threshing floor tonight and said, I want you to go down to that threshing floor. But you hide in the shadows. Don't let anybody know you're there. And said to her, now you mark the place where Boaz lays down in that threshing floor. Several reasons why she told her to mark the place. Number one, Boaz wasn't going to be the only man in that threshing floor. And she said, mark the place where he lays down. What she's saying is, for heaven's sake, don't lay down at the foot of a poor man. Our problem now is that we're poor. But whatever you do, don't lay down at no poor man's feet. Don't lay down at the wrong man's feet. The, another reason, she said, mark the place was because she knew at some point the lights were going to go out. Uh, you know, uh, Duke Energy hadn't gone by there yet. They hadn't strung no lights. Uh, and, and she knew at some time, they're gonna, at some point, they're going to turn them lamps out. It's going to get mighty dark in that threshing floor. So you just mark the place where you see him lay down. Uh, you mark the place, and then after he's laying down, you walk into that threshing floor, lay down at his feet, and ask him to spread his skirt over you. Now, what she's trying to do is she's trying to find a, a husband uh, for Ruth. She's trying to find an identity for her. 
She goes into that threshing floor uh, and she laid down uh, at that uh, at Boaz's feet. Well, you only do that, folks. In that culture, you only do that with a near kinsman. You, that only occurs with a near kinsman. Now, in order to be a kinsman, several things have got to happen. Number one, first of all, uh, you got to be the closest kin possible. The next thing is this. Uh, they have to have the ability to redeem. In other words, they got to have some money. And then the next thing, not only must they be kin, not only must they have the means, but they've got to have the heart. They've got to want to redeem. Well, uh, you know, that's the reason she sent her down to that threshing floor, uh, you know, to find out what Boaz's intentions were. Well, she washed uh, and she changed her clothes and she perfumed herself. Need to stop here long enough to tell you this. However bad things are going in your life, uh, there, there comes a time when you got to make up in your mind just because I'm married to the dead doesn't mean I got to look like the wife of the dead. It doesn't mean I got to smell like the wife of the dead. I, in other words, I don't have to walk around with this look on my face that tells everybody I'm defeated. I don't have to go through life with my chin on my chest and let everybody know that I don't have the victory. I'm telling you, there comes a time you need to bathe yourself you need to change your clothes you need to oil anoint yourself and say devil I'm not going to act the way the world expects me to act somebody ought to shout amen so she did exactly what Naomi said she went down to that threshing floor and she marked the spot and when the lights went out she eased herself into that threshing floor and laid down at Boaz's feet now Boaz is a type of the Lord of the harvest he's a type of Christ she laid down at his feet I tend to believe that when she laid down she laid down crossways or perpendicular to the way Boaz is laying I believe that they're bodies. She at his feet, he laid in that threshing floor, formed a cross. I'm telling you, the answer is still in the cross of Jesus Christ. It does not matter, uh, you know, how far advanced man gets, how much you know, how much you've learned. It does not matter. The answer can always be traced back to that cross where Jesus died for the sins of man. It is the answer. Now, we don't stop there. You go on to that upper room, but I'm telling you, that answer is found in that cross. Well, uh, she's laying there, and, and I don't know how long she waited. I'm assuming for hours, but she laid down at his feet, and that man who's a type of Christ paid her no mind. Ever been there? You ever needed an answer? Ever needed help? And it seemed like the heavens were brass. She listened. He wasn't halfway across the world. She was laying at his feet. And he, you know, she's laying there. He's a type of that Christ, and he pays her no mind. Listen, she's laying in the dark. The lights have gone out. She's laying in the dark. That threshing floor, uh, you know, was pressed hard. She, she, he didn't give her no sleeping bag. Didn't offer her no hay or straw. She's laying on that hard floor in the dark. She's alone. Nobody knows her. He doesn't even pay her any mind. She's laying there. She's waiting for an answer. And he never even hints that he, that he knows she's there. It would not be until midnight that he'd even stir. You, you know where mid, what, what midnight is, don't you? Midnight is when you're only halfway through that experience. You got as far to go as you've already come. And so it's midnight before he even stirs. And when he stirs, the first thing he wants to know is, who are you? Isn't it tough when you go to pray and it seems like you've got to tell God who you are before you can get anywhere? That's right. I've gone to pray when I felt like an absolute stranger. I can't, I can't understand all the experiences that believers have, but I can tell you there have been those times I've crawled up in that altar and I felt like I had to tell God who I was before I could even get started. But he asked her, who are you? She said, I'm Ruth, and, and would you spread your skirt over me? Now, there's, there's nothing underward about that, folks. There's nothing X-rated about that. All she's saying is, will you be and do 
the, the, the work of the kinsman, the responsibility of the kinsman redeemer. And this is what he said to her. He said, I'd love to do that. He said, I'd, I'd be honored to do that. He said, but there is a kinsman who's closer kin than I am. I've got to find out what he's got to say about this because he has the first choice. You know, when I was studying that uh, some time ago, uh, and, and I knew that Boaz was a type of the Lord of the harvest, a type of Christ. And for that Christ to say, there's a nearer kinsman than me, blew my mind. I said, I said to God, I know that Boaz is a type of Christ, but who could be closer than Christ? I, my, my, I, I had it all wrong. The word nearer kinsman doesn't mean closer. It just mean, means it came first. Uh, Boaz was saying there's somebody who came along before I did. He's first in line. I got to find out what he's up to. I asked God, I said, what does that mean? What could have come before Christ? And, and, and as God is my witness, I believe God dropped into my spirit the law. You can shout when you get home. I believe that when she said, cast your skirt over me, he said, there is a nearer kinsman to me. Let me find out. What, he has, what he's decided, what he'll decide to do. Let me tell you some folks. I believe that other kinsman was a type of the law. And I believe that Boaz's action just simply shows the world that the law cannot redeem. You know, whenever, whenever Boaz cornered that man in the gate, he said to him, he said, uh, you know, uh, Naomi's come back home, brought her daughters-in-law, and you're closer kin than I am. You need to buy that land back. He said, I'd be happy to. Then Boaz said, wait a minute. While you're buying back the land, you got to buy the hand of Ruth. He said, I can buy that land, but I can't buy her hand. He said, you, you, you redeem all of that. Now, I've gotten ahead of myself just a little bit, but, but the point that I wanted to make is simply this. He said, there's a nearer kinsman. Got to that gate and found out that that nearer kinsman, a type of the law, Cannot redeem. Nod your little head, yeah. Got to that gate and found out that that law is insufficient. And Boaz, a type of Christ, whenever that law handed that shoe to him, he said, I'll both buy back the land and I'll marry the woman. Does anybody hear me? Jesus came into this world, secured for himself a bride, and I'm looking for him any day. He will come back any time now. But you know, all that story just shows that the law was weak and could not totally Redeemed man. Well, she spent the night after he spoke to her at midnight. She, he still didn't offer her an air mattress. He didn't offer her a soft bed. He just said, you stay here till morning. It didn't get no lighter. That floor didn't get any softer. She just laid there till morning. And he never said another blessed thing to her. He never uttered another word till daybreak. And then he seemed to be in a hurry. He said, hand here that veil. He measured her, uh, you know, some of that grain. I did a study, uh, you know, what she would gleaned earlier. The Bible gave an amount. What he, what he measured in that veil was a double portion compared to what she had, had gleaned earlier in the book. So at daybreak, early in the morning, he gives her a double portion, and he rushes her out of that, out of that threshing floor. Don't need anybody to know that you spent the night here. Well, uh, you know, she spent the night in the dark in a hard place uh, on that floor. Uh, you know, he said very little to her, and now he's rushing her away. Don't complain, though. You got a double portion out of the ordeal. So she went home, and, and, and Naomi wanted to know, Naomi wanted to know Ruth, what did he say? Ruth told her the story, and this is what Naomi said, one of my favorite passages in all the Word of God. She said, sit down here, honey. I'm paraphrasing now. She said, sit down here, honey. She said, that man won't rest until he finished this work today. You, you, you know what she was saying to Ruth? She was saying to Ruth, honey, you've got a restless redeemer out there working for you. 
He's going to finish this thing today. Can I tell you that we have a restless Redeemer? He hung the sun, the moon, and the stars. He stretched the north over the empty place. Somebody said he spat out seven seas and he stacked up the mountains. He went to Calvary. He died there. Excuse me. He rose the third day. He ascended to the right hand of the Father. And every day he's making intercession for us. I'm telling you, we have a restless Redeemer. Redeemer tonight and beyond all of that he's planning his return just any day now he's a restless redeemer well you know he went to that gate he cornered that that near kinsman near kinsman said I can't do it it'll mar my inheritance so he took his shoe off and he handed it to Boaz remember early on I asked you Rick what happened to that shoe this is what I believe happened to it I believe Boaz took that shoe left the gate where all those witnesses were and went straight to Naomi's house. I think she, he wanted to know is Ruth here. Walked in and maybe Naomi said, hello, cousin Boaz. He may have said, hello, cousin Naomi. Is Ruth here? And Ruth came out of another room and, uh, and, and he said to Ruth that nearer kinsman could not redeem the land and marry it. So he gave me his shoe. She knew that culture. She understood, uh, you know, in that area of the world uh, what that meant. said, he took his shoe off and gave it to me. This is my right to buy back all of this land and to take your hand in marriage. But I wasn't expecting a bride today. I've got to go prepare a place for you. Oh, you're a dead bitch right there. I've got to go prepare a place for you. And, and when, I, when I do that, I'll come again. It'll take me about a year, but I'll come back at the end of a year, and, and I'll marry you if you'll have me. Well, that's exactly what she wanted. He said, but as a token of my promise, he gave her the shoe. All shout when you get to the house. Gave her the shoe. I believe that he probably said to her, this is the token of my promise. It's my solemn word to you. Remember I started out talking about the power of the word of God. This is my solemn promise to you that a year from today when I prepare a place for you, I will come after you and you'll become my wife and we'll move out of here and you don't ever have to come back to this house anymore. Will somebody shout praise the Lord? Now he left. The house is as empty as it was before he showed up with the exception of one thing. That's you. She can't hear them footsteps no more. She can't hear his voice no more. He's gone. And for one year, she's still got to go out on that field and reap or clean. For one year, she's got to sit with strangers at a table. You know what I believe happened? I believe when she went to work, she stuck that shoe in her apron pocket. The reason I say this because that's what I'd have done if I was him. I wouldn't have left that shoe at the house for anybody to come steal it. And I went to work, I'd have stuck that shoe in my apron pocket, and I'd have went out here and gleaned them fields. And when I went to the when I went to the table at lunchtime to dip my bread in the vinegar, I'd have had that shoe with me. I'd have felt every once in a while to make sure it's still there. You know what I think probably happened? I think in that field for one year, there were folks that would say to her, maybe them reapers, those men, would say to her, Hey, Ruth, what you going to do with that old shoe? I got a feeling if that was me, I'd have felt to make sure it's still there when they asked me that. Go sit down at that table at lunch time to eat, and they'd probably say, Hey, Ruth, what you going to do with that old shoe? I can imagine some beautiful, young Hebrew maiden would say, Ruth, your soil of goods. Too many of us beautiful Hebrew women around here, he ain't ever going to come back after you. He ain't going to marry no widow. He ain't going to marry a has-been. I can, I can just see Ruth reaching to make sure she has that shoe. Everybody with me? And, and it's my opinion that for one year, she endured those kind of jabs from that crowd. 
He ain't ever going to come after you. He don't really love you. He didn't really mean that. But the difference was, folks, Ruth had the shoe, and they didn't. Ruth had the shoe, and they didn't. I believe the closer that it got to his coming after her, the more intense those attacks became. I want to I wanna talk about that shoe just a little bit. Whenever he brought her that shoe, understand something, it wasn't a woman's shoe. It was a man's shoe. And chances are, chances are he didn't go down to shoe show and buy a shoe just to give to Boaz. He actually had walked in that shoe and at the gate he took it off and gave it to Boaz. Now when Boaz gave it to Ruth, I got every idea that shoe was too big for her. She stick her foot in that shoe and the shoe would swallow her foot. Now I look at you and tell that don't mean nothing. You remember what you remember what uh, Paul said when he said your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. You, you know the thing about that is uh, that this word is not something uh, that you just talk about. It's not just something you recite or remember. You know, this is something you walk out in shoe leather every day. Your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. If she slid her foot in that shoe, I've got every idea it was so big it would swallow her foot. You know what that says to me? That says to me that the word of God God is big enough for me and you, my family and your family. I'm telling you, I can put all of my problems in the Word of God and there's still room for your problems. Somebody ought to shout with me. It's a man's shoe. Let me just stop right there. Don't don't get upset with me here. If if you do, you can apologize at the church and everything will be all right. But God is not the author of women's lib. I'm not saying that women ought to be mistreated, ought not be paid right. That ain't what I'm saying. I'm just saying God's not the author of women's lib that pits male against female. No, no. God's not the author of any of that stuff that will take a mama out of the house when those kids need her. No, no. I, you, you know, I, I just don't believe God's the author of all of that. Uh, but what I came, what I stopped here to say is that shoe was not a woman's shoe. It was a man's shoe. I'm telling you that God has no feminine qualities about him, whatever. He's not a sissy. He's not a homosexual. Shout me down, somebody. He's God. Let me tell you how much God he is. He's so much God that he can measure the waters of the earth in the hall of his hand. He's so much God. He can sit on the circle of the earth and the inhabitants thereof are as grasshoppers. He's so much God that he can walk on water. He's so much God that he can raise the dead. He's so much God that he can die on a cross. He's so much God that he can get up out of a bar or tomb. Does anybody hear me? Does that sound like a sissy to you? No, no. It was a man's shoe. Uh, Let me tell you something else I believe about that shoe. It was worn, but it wasn't worn out. This book's been around a long time. Folks are trying to get rid of it in our day. I'll admit to you, it's worn. But I'll be quick to tell you, it ain't worn out. John 3, 16 is as powerful tonight as it was the first time I ever heard it. It's as powerful tonight as it was when it was written, when it was inspired. I'm just trying to tell you, folks, that this word may be worn, but it is not worn out. In a million years after every book is burned on this planet, the Word of God will still be alive. Hallelujah. That, that shoe, you know, that, that, she, that, that he gave her wasn't her size. But let me tell you what it was. It was her wedding promise. It was the one thing that Boaz gave to her as a token and said, one year from today, I'll be back for you. 
Listen, there's never been a time when folks have hollered any louder that there'll be no rapture. I know I've mentioned that several times. The, the, the church seems to have settled in. The church seems to have found a home. And I agree with that old songwriter. This world is not my home. I'm only passing through. That's right. I'm a pilgrim and a stranger here. Uh, I do believe in a pre-tribulation rapture. I believe that it's got to be that way. If, if his appearing is going to be sudden and unexpected, if you can't calculate the time, I believe it's got to be before the tribulation. The thing I'm trying to tell you is simply this. For one year, she put up with hell and high water. The devil came against her. The only thing she had was that shoe of token that he said, I will come and take you under myself. Now, maybe the night before. She's calculated the days. Tomorrow's going to be a year. She knows he's coming. Maybe that night she didn't sleep very much. Have you ever been to the place you needed an answer from God or you needed some kind of reassurance and you'd, you'd sleep with your Bible under your pillow? She may have taken that shoe. Put it into whatever pitiful pillows you had. Sometimes when you're real restless and real uncertain, real anxious, you might move it from under that pillow and just hold it across your chest. I can see her take that shoe from under her head and just lay it across her heart. Just have it close to her. Probably didn't sleep much that night. A thousand devils said, tomorrow you're going to be the laughing stock of Israel. You're going to find out everything they said around that table at that field's true. You're going to find out everything the reaper says true. You'll be the laughing stock of Israel by sunset. She puts that pillow back, Lord, that, that shoe back under her head. Then she pulls it back across her chest. It's the only thing she has. He hadn't been there in a year. Is everybody with me? But the one thing she refused to do for a year is get rid of that shoe. I'm not going to throw this shoe away. It's the last thing he left me when he said, in a year, I'll return for you. She passed the night, woke up the next morning. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming it just about had to be this way because the culture was, uh, you know, they, uh, he took a year. The, the groom would always take a year to prepare for that bride. I got a feeling that she didn't rest well that night, but the next day, Soon as day broke, too early for folks to be stirring. She don't hear anything. One hour passes. She doesn't hear anything. Some more time passes. She doesn't hear anything. And a thousand devils start howling. I told you. I told you he won't come in. I told you he's done got somebody else and took him to that house he just built. But in time, there was a noise. I don't believe Boaz came alone. I believe he had an entourage. I believe there was a procession with him. I believe she heard the music before she ever saw anything. And then she saw him, and that procession crest a hill coming to her house. He's kept his word. He said to her, in a year, I'll come, I'll come back for you. And the only thing she had for one year was that shoe, a token of his solemn promise. I need to ask you something here tonight. Have men learned so much that they've changed your mind about the Word of God? I, I noticed this week a lot of folks, when uh, you know, when they did the prayer list, a number of folks out of your church suffering from cancer. A number of them. And, and then some other things that, that you know, just, just pretty bad. But listen to me. I don't care. How many folks die with cancer? He still heals cancer. Don't throw the book away because you bury some folks that die with cancer. He still heals. Listen, if folks die with lung disease, don't throw that shoe away. Don't throw. What you going to do with that old shoe? What you going to do with that promise? I just got word last night when I was leaving church. 
uh, that my uncle, I only have two aunts left uh, from my daddy's side. All of his siblings are dead. My daddy and everybody else except two sisters. The oldest of those two sisters, her husband, just died uh, on Tuesday, had lung cancer. I'm not going to throw this book away and say God doesn't heal cancer just because my uncle died with lung cancer. You hear what I'm telling you? Jesus went to that whipping post 2,000 years before my uncle ever got cancer. The Bible said with his stripes, we're healed. Now the Bible also says this. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Now just because the Bible says that, is everybody saved? Will everybody be saved? Well, apply that same thing to that scripture, with whose stripes or by whose stripes we are healed, we were healed. Does that mean everybody's going to be healed just because he took stripes on it? History will tell you that ain't so. They're going to bury my uncle in a couple of days. He died of lung cancer. History will tell you everybody not going to be healed. That don't mean he shut the door in my face and said, Jimmy, I'm not going to heal you. You know why? Because I'm still holding on to that old shoe. I'm still holding on to that promise said he went to that whipping post and with his stripes we are healed. Well, you're a little too quiet there for folks with that kind of promise. Well, I, I told you a couple of times I mentioned uh, my, my middle son, 29 years old today, he celebrated a birthday. And for 11 years, my son has been backslid. There have been times the devil has said to me, he ain't ever going to make it back. There have been times the devil has said to me, I'll have him. You know what? I haven't thrown my Bible away just because the devil said, I'm going to have Jamie. No, I hadn't stopped praying just because the devil said, Jamie will never make it back. No, oh, the devil is a lie. I said the devil is a lie. Because I believe God, the truth of God is greater than the lie of the devil. And the truth will always outlive a lie. I just believe that one of these days my son's going to call me or walk up to me and say, Daddy, I just made everything right. Everything's going to be okay. Can, can I just share this story with you? My, my oldest boy, at one time all three of my sons were backslidden, and my oldest son gave his life to the Lord of what must have been the coldest morning of the winter. I was starting revival the first of the year. I was starting revival on the way to church. I checked that thermometer on my vehicle, and it said 27 degrees. My son loved to hear this local preacher on the radio on Sunday mornings. He was attending a local church of God. And they go pay their tithe. They, they weren't saved, he and his wife. And, and he got up that morning, and he didn't have, you know, county or city water. He has a, a you know, has an has a electric pump. Uh, and, and the water was frozen. Mind you, and I'm on my way to church. It's about close to 1030. It's 27 degrees. My son got up. The water's frozen. He turned on the radio. He's trying to listen to the preacher. And he's going to that, that faucet, and he's going to that pump, just making that circle, that radio to hear the preacher, checking that faucet, Go into that pump. After a while, conviction had got, he said to God, said, we don't have water. said, we can't go to church, can't pay my tithe today. Well, he's making that circuit. Finally, he just sat down on his sofa, broke out in tears, crying, and said, Lord, just forgive me of all of my sins. And the son gave his life to the Lord, sitting on the sofa in his living room. Before God, this is the truth, he got up, walked over to that faucet and turned that faucet on and the water started running. That's a physical impossibility, folks, because at 1030 it's still 27 degrees. You know what I think? I think God allowed that water to freeze just long enough for that boy to give his life to God. And when he surrendered to God, God made that water flow so he could get on to church.
You can believe what you want to, but I believe that's what God did. And then my youngest son, I believe it was the same year, got saved what must have been the hottest day of the summer. He came into the bedroom, and, and, and I didn't know it, Mom didn't know it, but he'd been smoking pot, and he was, he was high. But he's under conviction. He walked to the door and said, Mom, Dad, I want you to pray for me. I believe God's dealing with me. Now, you've got to be a mom or married to one to know, understand this. My boy's every bit as tall as I am. And she's, my wife said, come here, baby. Grown youngin. She said, come here, baby. That boy crawled up in that bed between his mom and me and laid his head right there. Started talking to us. He said, I thought I'd gotten to the place. The Spirit had left me that God would never deal with me again. He's laying there talking, crying in tears. Hot tears are falling on my chest. He said, but I believe. I've been asking God for two or three days now, a week or so. Please, God, deal with me. Please convict me. Convict me. Please draw me. And he said, I believe. Listen, folks, he just smoked pot. He had smoked pot before he come home. And he said, I believe God's dealing with me. Well, I told him, you need to go find your place while your heart's tender and talk to God. He got off the bed, went to the other end of the house. After a while, my wife said, is that Josh? I said, I don't know. Next thing you know, there's this six one figure steps into the doorway of our bedroom. And he said, Mom, Dad, you don't ever have to worry about me again. He said, Jesus, just save me. That's the reason I'm not going to throw the book away just because the devil says, I'm going to have that middle son. I just want the devil to know I prayed for them other two boys too. I can't tell you times I woke up in the middle of the night and heard my wife praying, oh, God, please save my babies. Grown youngins, folks, grown youngins. My wife would wake up in the middle of the night, oh, God, please save my babies. So many times I heard that. So I'm not going to throw the book away just because the devil said, I'm going to have that middle boy. Don't throw the book away just because you have a, a sickness or a disease, and it seems like it won't go nowhere. Don't throw the book away. I got a question for you. What are you going to do with that old shoe? Whose report are you going to believe? Heaven and earth may pass away, but his word won't stand forever. Would you stand with us all over this house when you have stood? I wonder if you just raise your hands and thank him. Would you just raise your hands and thank him for the truth of the word of God? Even during those times, it seems a thousand devils are drowning out the voice of the word of God. Would you just thank him for the power resident in his word tonight? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. you got unsaved family. Whatever you do, you hold on to every promise in that book that has to do with salvation. You hold on to every promise in that book. The devil tells you there'll be no rapture. You hold on to every scripture in that, in that book that speaks of a catching away. If you've been seeking God and haven't been filled with the Holy Ghost as of yet, don't throw the promises away that the Holy Ghost is for you. God wants you to be filled with the Holy Ghost. The list goes on. I don't, it doesn't matter to me what the scenario may be. Don't throw away the promise of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. All of these things haven't been said tonight. I just wonder, hadn't done this all week. I just wonder if there are folks here tonight that have a special need for prayer. And you say, Preacher, I'd like for you all just to anoint me and 
believe God with me for this matter. Now, if you respond, we'll pray. If you don't, we'll go get a glass of tea here in a few minutes. See, I don't feel, I don't feel the responsibility to heal you. I don't feel the responsibility to save your family. I don't feel the responsibility to turn your financial situation around. See, I know ahead of time I can't do that. But I got a book that's absolutely full of promises. Absolutely full of promises. If you respond and step out, come down here and we pray for you. I hope it ain't because you say, well, preacher, I believe you. I hope it's because you say, preacher, I believe him. I hope it ain't because you say, well, preacher, I take your word for it. I've got a better idea. Take his word for it. Because his word will endure forever. See, all he's looking for is somebody that will just believe his word. Do like Ruth. Take that shoe and carry it with you everywhere you go. Just hang on to the promise. Is everybody here that needs a special touch from the Lord? Pastor's going to come. Others that want to help us pray, if you'd come. We're just going to believe God tonight. children are lost he wants to see them saved would you stretch your hand this way let's just believe God Father you know where they are tonight he's holding on to the promises contained in your word concerning those wayward children Father you won't give up on them that prodigal went into a far country down there Lord things got to the point he woke up when he woke up he came home do that with his children God wake them up Wake them up and send them home. Save them, every one of them. Every one of them tonight, God. We lay hold on the promise of God. We believe you. Save his children in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Father, every need of her life tonight, you know about it. We believe you to touch her now. Drive back the hand of the enemy. Let faith arise in her. Let her lay hold on the promise of God. I pray, God, that tonight you bring to pass, Father, the desire of her heart. Do it. We'll give you praise for it. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. You praise him tonight, young lady. way folks let's believe God Father our eyes are upon you tonight these things are beyond us God our arms are too short our weak our strength is too weak we believe you for a miracle tonight we refuse to throw the promise away thank you tonight God thank you hallelujah hallelujah show up tonight God show up tonight in the name of Jesus Hallelujah, hallelujah. I believe God. I believe God tonight. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, God. We thank you for every promise in the Word of God. We thank you, Lord, that the Word of God is worn, but it isn't worn out. He'd ever need now, God. We bind the work of the enemy. We loose the power of God. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, Oh, 
Hallelujah. That's right, sister. Lay hold on it. Lay hold on to it. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. sister, I think you know this, but that addiction is a spirit. Two or three of us are gathered here tonight. We're going we're gonna to agree together and bind that power tonight. Hallelujah. It's not my word. That's his word. Father, two or three of us are gathered here tonight. We're gathered together. Father, we bind that spirit of addiction over her family, those that she mentioned to me now. We lose your power now to set them free devil, you might as well surrender him. You might as well turn him loose. Send this deliverance in every direction of the weather vein. Loose him tonight, God. Hallelujah. The promises of God are yes and amen. Yes and amen. away just because of the bad news, my sister. Don't throw his promise away just because of that bad news. God, we thank you tonight for the promises that in Christ are yes and amen. Now in spite of the bad news, God, we're going to trust you. In spite of all of the difficulty, the challenges, like Ruth in a dark place, her lot in life is a hard place. Yet, God, we believe you. We believe we're not going to move. We're, gonna, we're not going to move from the promise of God. Show yourself strong in this very difficult time. Show yourself strong in her life on her behalf. We curse the work of the enemy. Loose the power of God to move in her life right now in Jesus. In Jesus' name.
what you're going to do with that old shoe. Would you testify to one or two folks? Tell them what you're going to do with it tonight. Just recently, there's, I, I, I was, my wife and kids and I, we went to a movie rental place to get us a movie. And there were two movies on the shelf, one called The Remaining and one called Left Behind. Haven't seen The Remaining, don't know much about it, but I just read the description and it talks about those that are being left at the trumpet of, at the trumpet of God. There is, a, there is a stir, I believe, in the world for truth. But my fear is where they're going to find that truth. But there's only one place to find that truth. Just like the preacher preached tonight, it's in that old shoe, it's in that book. Tried true, tested. Been on the bestseller list since its inception. <laughs> it's a good old book. It'll never fail you. It'll never let you down. Its promises are yes and amen. And I thank God for the Word of God tonight, don't you? Come on, let God know how much you appreciate His Word tonight. Thankful for what God has promised. And I'm thankful tonight that He's going to fulfill what He promised. I'm thankful tonight, and I'm just going to go ahead and praise Him in advance for the promises that He gave me that they are coming to pass. Thank God for His Word. Amen. Sometimes I believe we've got to walk as Abraham walked. Abraham declared His name to be Abraham, father of many nations, before he even had any children. But He had a promise. He had a Word. Romans said he spoke things that were not as if though they were. You see, Abraham wasn't speaking some fictitious fairy tale. Abraham was speaking and declaring the Word of God. And I believe if we'll declare the Word of God over our circumstances, over our situations, I believe we'll start to see some things turn around because there's power in the Word of God. Amen. Aren't you thankful for that Word tonight? One more time, let God know you love Him because He sure loves you. Amen. Amen. Listen, I appreciate those that visited tonight. Thank you so much. We're going one more night. Tomorrow night, let your family and friends know. And uh, pray for those that are battling this sickness. Appreciate Brother Price coming. Worship with us tonight. Brother Ivy, thank you so much. Pat, Gerald, I'm still waiting on my lunch. I appreciate you coming out tonight. Thank you so much. God bless you. <laughs> God's so good. Amen. Shake, shake hands, hug necks. Make sure you do it in that order. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing you tomorrow night. God bless you.